Hallelujah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I can hear the voices singing soft and low. Soft and low. Hallelujah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. In the darkness of night, not a star was in sight. On the highway that leads down below. Down below. Well, Jesus came in and saved my soul from sin. Hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I can hear the voices singing soft and low. Soft and low. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Oh, yeah. Well, sinners don't wait until it's too late. He's a wonderful Savior, you know. You know. When I fell on my knees, He answered my pleas. Hallelujah, Hallelujah I'm, ready I'm ready to go. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I can hear the voices singing soft and low. Soft and low. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I can hear the voices singing soft and low. Soft and low. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm ready to go. Hallelujah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. I can hear the voices singing soft and low. Soft and low. Hallelujah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. Hallelujah. I'm ready to go. time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe in this broken generation all is dark you help us see and there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in god the father we believe in jesus christ we believe in the holy spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion We believe that He conquered death We believe in the resurrection That He's coming back again We believe So let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing in our weakness and temptation we believe we believe yeah. we believe in god the father we believe in jesus christ we believe in the holy spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death we believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again let the lost be found 
and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud. Our God will say, we believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back. He's coming back again. He's coming back again.
I've been washed by the blood. Yeah, I've been washed by the blood. Father, we thank you that, Lord, as we do look to you, Father, we thank you that we do find righteousness and holiness all in one person and that's the name of Jesus that we look to so father tonight as we celebrate the goodness and mercy of everything that Jesus did for us that he's doing in us and through us lord we ask that father that you would just come show up in this place that lord tonight tonight is your night so father we ask that you would come shine fathers we've already seen through testimonies through prayer requests this morning or this afternoon how many things that the devil's already got his hands in but lord how much more so do you have your voice in so so, Lord, we just speak for you to bless over this place and speak over this place. Lord, we ask that your presence be so thick and heavy here tonight that, Lord, people will not even want to leave tonight, that, Lord, they just want to stay. So, Father, we praise you, we glorify you, and we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Guys, Mr. Rex, you're an awesome young man. Thank you, sir. Will y'all give me just a minute before we get started, please? you would I'm going to ask I'm going to pull an audible uh, media team uh, so if y'all look back there in the back you will notice that there's a different face back there uh, sitting beside Marty tonight Miss Stacy is back there helping out she is trying to learn how we do things back there in the back so she can fill in as a alternate from time to time and for help when we need it um, so this will give you an experience about how to pull up a scripture so if you would, please, if y'all would turn in your Bibles to Numbers 11, 23. Actually... I'm going to be looking at Numbers 11 for a little bit, but we're going to focus on 23. As I was praying earlier, the one thing that kept coming to my voice or kept coming to my mind was that not only is God able, but he is willing. And that's the thing that just kept going through my mind. I can't get it out of my mind. How many of you know that it, faith is not knowing that God can, but knowing that God will? How many of you have ever wondered whether or not God would move in your life or do something or you're waiting for him to do something and it just seems like he moves at a snail's pace? There's some times we'd kind of like God to hurry up, wouldn't we? Why? Because it deals with our comfort zone. It deals with how we feel about things. And the reality is that we need to get out of our comfort zone a whole lot more. And when you look at uh, Numbers chapter 11... Uh, you see where the people, it says in, in Numbers chapter 11, starting in verses 1. Y'all don't go there. I'm just kind of giving you a little heads up. It says, Now the people complained about their hardships and hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned from there among them, and he consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down, so that uh, the place was called Teborah, which means because 
fire from the Lord had burned among them. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have got tired of waiting for something and complained? You just got tired and said, man, I'm just going to bellyache. I'm going to moan. I'm going to groan. And it is my right. I'm upset. I didn't have something work out the way that I wanted it. So therefore, I am just going to have my little pity party. I'm going to get up on the pity wagon and until I fall off when we hit the biggest pothole. Amen. Guys, I'm here to tell you, God's people was never meant to be complainers. Matter of fact, God's people were meant to be overcomers, and God's people was meant to be warriors, not to be people that complained all the time. When I'm sitting there reading the scripture, and I read in there that the people complain, and all of a sudden, the Lord hears it, and fire breaks out amongst the people. How many of you know, if that happened a lot more, we would probably complain a lot less, I mean, if you know, if you were kind of like worried and all of a sudden you're at the water cooler and you start thinking about you're complaining because you don't have this or that, and all of a sudden somebody looks at you and says, what did you say? And then you repeat it, and all of a sudden, how many of you ever heard a cigarette lighter? You know, whenever you try to light it, you just know that sound. You're like, whoa, 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 never mind, never mind. Uh, my bad, I wasn't, I didn't mean that, I'm, I'm messing up. Guys, the people of God are a victorious people. You have fire, you have energy, and you have authority in your life. How many of you realize that the enemy is looking to seek whom he may kill, steal, and destroy? How many of you ever thought that the devil's knocking on your door? What was that song back in, what was it, probably the 80s and 90s, the devil's at my front door? Yeah, somebody's knocking. Y'all remember that song? I remember sitting there singing that song when I was a kid and thinking it was a pretty cool song. But how many of you know that's probably the one song that we don't need to be singing? Because here's the thing is, Jesus said that he is knocking and that whoever would open the door. So we need to determine who's knocking at our door. Amen? How many of you know the signal when somebody shows up at your house? What's the old signal? That means you probably know the person, right? Now, what happens when you hear this one? It's probably a debt collector wanting to come get a debt. Amen? It's probably somebody saying, hey, you've messed up and we're coming to get you. Or what? You got experience in that area, huh? One of the things that I would tell you is that we need to determine what we think and what we say according to the Word of God. When we start grumbling and complaining, do you know that one of the reasons why the people stayed in the desert for 40 years is because they were a bunch of grumblers and complainers? I don't know about y'all, but how many of you want to come home to a spouse that does nothing but grumble and complain? Anybody? How many of you want to go to work when you got a boss that's a grumbler or a complainer? Or a nagger. Guys, let me tell you something. God is the same way. He wants to get drawn into your presence. He wants you to invite him into your life every day. And it's got to be your choice to invite him, not a begging him to come save you. Why? Because God has already given you the authority. What did Jesus say? All authority in heaven and earth I have given unto you. How many of you have received that authority? All right, and some of you say, Pastor, what does that mean to have this authority? Simply to be able to call things out. I don't know about y'all, but how many of you like talking to a liar? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? You ever talk to a liar? Somebody, they can't tell you the truth for nothing? Standing right in front of you and you're telling you 120 different things, and you know at least 119 and a half of them are lies. Sometimes we need to call things out for what they are. And when somebody's lying, you need to call them out for it. Amen? How many of you realize that sometimes we need to be careful about who we hang around with because what they espouse, we take into our mind. And what happens, it gets into our mind, it festers, and it, all of a sudden it causes us problems, don't it? What's the old saying? Good things in, good things out. How many of you know that if you go to the doctor and all you eat is cheeseburgers and french fries every day for 40 years, uh, your doctor is going to turn around and tell you you're a cheeseburger. Why? Because you are what you eat. In the spiritual realm, you are what you listen to. How many of you have watched 
movies that you were convicted of after you got through watching them? Or songs whenever they sang? Let me tell you something. I am this old country classic guy. I've told you all multiple times, I love George Jones. I love George Strait. I love the old country gospel or the old country foundation people. And whenever you hear somebody like that singing, man, it just makes me want to just turn up the volume. And let me tell you something, I'm a preacher, and I, I love the Lord, but there's something about Johnny Paycheck when he says, take this job in, that man, you want to sing it to the top of your lungs, don't you? Why? Because we all got a little bit of complaint in us, no matter who we are. The music is not what we want it to be. The air conditioner is too cold. Your church is way too far. My husband doesn't understand how I think. Honey child, let me tell you something. Ain't no man ever going to understand what you think. You don't even understand what you think. How is he? And then you're also going to have this point in time where you're going to have this woman saying, that man ought to know what I, I, I feel. He's been married to me long enough. He don't even know what he feels. Amen. How is he going to know what you feel? So what happens when things don't work out like what we want? We start grumbling. And we start getting upset. Looking at this prayer list, we got to be really careful about the witnesses that we portray because if we are victorious people in God and we have authority and we have power, how many of you know that there's a difference about boldly proclaiming what God will do for you and in you and through you, rather than what the devil is. Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to brag about what the devil's done. How many of you know what the devil's done in your life is pretty evident, amen? What does he do? Seek and steal, to kill, steal, and destroy. Guys, I want you all to know something. You, have a, you serve a living God. Somebody mentioned to me one time here about the church with us having the acreage about putting in a cemetery here. And I said, no, we're not going to put a cemetery in here because the church was made for the living. How many of you know when you come to church, you ought to be alive? How many of you ought to be happy because God gave you one more day? How many of you know that yesterday was a pretty messed up day, but today has got potential, even though it's not over with yet? So when the enemy comes against you, I want you to start thinking about this. When you start mumbling and grumbling and you start thinking about how everything go is going so bad, why don't we start thinking about how everything is going so good? I don't know about y'all, but there's some times that I get a little upset. I know you get upset. You liar. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Calling it out. Jesse could tell you he's had some bad days. Marilyn can tell you she's had some bad days. And so it's really easy to come back to this point. But I want you to look over. We see where when you go back through, the people had complained and moaned and groaned. So if you look in verses 4 through, they were tired of the manna. They were tired of what God was supplying I don't know about y'all, but I've always thought manna is looking something like marshmallows or something. You know, it's just this childhood story that you've always had in your mind that this little white fluffy thing and whatever was in it was enough to be able to supply you for all of your nutrients. Amen. So you could go around and you pick it up. We all know it was like bread and everything. And there was only certain times that you could pick enough to last you more than one day. God sometimes will only give you what you need for that day. How many of you know that if you start picking more than what you need for that day, you get a little selfish, and other people don't get what they need? So then we start looking about after they've messed up, God decides that he is going to mess with them, and he brings in quail. How many of you have heard the story about how God brought in the quail for the people? It says in verses 4, it says, The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. How many of you ever had this little thing that if you only had just something else, something a little different? If you just had this, everything would be all right. Verse 5, there in Numbers 11 says, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost, also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now we have lost our appetite and we never see anything but this danged old manna. 
Now, I quoted that a little bit. That was a little bit of Pastor Stan in there. But let me ask you a question. How many of you have said that God has provided for you and given you everything that you need, but all of a sudden it's not enough or it's not what you want it to be? How many of you ever said, if I just had a little bit of cucumbers, if I just had a little bit of leeks, if I just had a little bit of garlic, if we just had some meat, how many of you know the manna was enough? We need to get a little bit more gratefulness into our spirits nowadays. One thing that scares me about this country today is we don't have enough gratefulness in our hearts. And guys, I don't know about y'all, I've been in other countries and I've seen the worst of the worst. And let me tell you something, the worst of what we have in America is still a whole lot better than elsewhere. I've seen people, I've seen children fight over an apple or an orange. How many of you ever had to fight somebody over an apple or an orange? Anybody? Man, we've got it good here. There's always people that are willing to help. But yet more so, we have a God that can help us whenever we need it. So when we start looking back, it says, but now we have lost our appetites. This is in verse 6. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like a coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it and then, uh, and then ground it into a handful of and crushed it into mortar. They cooked it in the pot and made it into cakes and tasted like something made with olive oil with the dew settled on the camp at night. The manna also came down. Guys, I don't know about y'all, but how many of you ever talked about the money tree at your house? When your kids wanted to borrow some money, you know that's a lie because there's no such thing as a kid borrowing money. You know what I'm saying? When a kid wants money, they ain't going to borrow it. It's theirs, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. But yet it says that this manna was coming down at nighttime. How many of you love to just be able to walk outside your front door and see everything that you need right out there in your front yard? Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? Your house be fixed, your car be fixed, enough money in the checking account to get through the day, enough food on the table. But you notice that even though that manna was provided, did you notice that it took people to process God's blessings to make it usable? All of a sudden, they started making tortillas out in the desert. They started making this bread. They started making this usefulness. When sometimes God gives you something, uh, we may have to put a little elbow grease into what God gave us to make it usable. Did you notice that Mama, or what is it, Mama Mia's or Rosa's or whatever it is, tortillas didn't just show up at their front doorstep? They had to go get this stuff, they had to process it, they had to grind it down, then they had to make it into a flour, then they made it into a bread. Guys, God's blessings are not there to make you fat and lazy. God's blessings are given to you for your provision, but you may have to put some elbow grease to God's blessings. And the bad thing is, is we want to sometimes complain and moan and groan and bellyache because we got to do a little work. Now guys, we're rural people, aren't we? We have to work. I don't know about y'all, but how many of you got a, a yard more than a half acre? All right. It ain't easy mowing a yard like that, is it? It takes some time. It takes some effort. It takes some energy. And right now, it takes a lot of gas or diesel to operate your lawnmowers. But let me tell you something. In the country, we think of or mowing the yard as therapy, don't we? Man, I don't want somebody coming taking my mowing job because that's my peace time. That's the time where I'm alone with God. I don't want somebody messing with my time with God. And I'm thankful that that grass is there. Why? Because God gave me a blessing. And because he gave me a blessing, it's going to take some efforts on my part to be able to make use of it. Amen? So let me ask you this question before I go on any farther. How many of you have moaned and groaned and griped and complained about your day today? Anybody? Raise your hands if that's you. Some of y'all need to raise your hands. Guys, let me tell you something. If you get this gratefulness in your heart, I don't know about y'all, but when I walk in this front door after being outside, it's like, what, in the mid-90s today, something like that, 92, 93? When you open that door, what happens? That air conditioner hits you the moment you walk in that door and you felt like you just left one place and entered another one. Do you know that when we are grumbling because it's hot outside and we're grumbling because of this or that, we're living in a dried, arid place, but when we get grateful, all of a sudden we enter into another place? 
And all of a sudden, we walk into an environment that's controlled by something else bigger than us. God is wanting to bless each and every one of you in exactly where you're at. All right, so when we start going through there, and it says that God tells the people that he's going to give them all this quail. They barbecue the stuff up. They eat it up. And they eat so much of it that they get sick. How many of you ever eaten something that was so good and you just kept eating and kept eating and you just got sick because you ate too much? Rodney's pointing you. That's big boys. We know that feeling. Guys, let me tell you something. You go to a crawfish bowl here in Texas, boy, these East Texans will put some damage on some mud bugs. Amen? I told the story about when we went to Oklahoma and they told us we were going to have all-you-can-eat mud bugs up there and my Texas crew put them people out of business. Not just out of business, but as dusty roads used to say, out of business. They went up there and they were ready for more, and they were coming back saying, no, we're shutting the kitchen down. It's done. It's done. How many of you know that you let somebody loose on something like that, they're going to get their feel. But there's a point in time where we have to start recognizing when we need to stop. We need to say, okay, we're good. God is going to take care of you today. We don't have to glutton for everything for tomorrow. Why? Because God said, give us, or what does the scripture say? Give us this day our daily bread. How many of you know what he gave you today, he'll do for you tomorrow? Amen? So you see, then God has to turn around and tell in verses 18. It says, tell the people to consecrate themselves. How many of you know we need to separate ourselves to consecrate ourselves? What does that mean? That means to prepare us, to make us clean, to make us holy so that we can go before the Lord. How many of you know sometimes for us to consecrate means that we might need to ask for forgiveness for something? How many of you have said something a little snarky to somebody and you have to go back and ask for forgiveness? Well, let me tell you something. As a married man, I wish I could tell you how many times I've said something hastily or just out of frustration to my wife and then have to go back and say, Kay, I so apologize. Will you please forgive me? Then what happens, the cold shoulder for about the next two hours? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And then all of a sudden, then you start coming about together and you start working it out. Everything starts getting in harmony again. You're consecrating your marriage, your relationship. When we have messed up and grumbled before the Lord, maybe we need to get ourselves straight before him. So look in verses 23. There in Numbers 11. Moses has been talking to him, and they've been going on back and forth. But there's this one little statement, and I want you to catch this. The Lord answered Moses, it is, is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not I say will come true for you. How many of you have wondered whether or not could, that God could do something for you? Do you know that only, there's only one thing that God cannot do? Do you know there are limitations on God's authority and power? Do you know that? The only thing that God cannot do is he cannot bless unforgiven sin or unrepented um, sin. We need to repent for the things that we've done. And when, when we live a life that is a willing sin in our life, it's hard for us to go to God and say, God, will you please bless our mess? How many of you got a mess that you want God to bless? If you've got a bless, or if you got a mess, God cannot bless it until you turn it over to Him. Guys, let me tell you something. I care. I'm not a your normal pastor. If you are the person that goes out and has a drink occasionally, if you're a person that smokes cigarettes, if you're a person that does uh, things that the average person would look down upon, personally, I don't rightly care. Whether or not you have a beer, if you have a drink, if you have a cigarette, let me ask you a question. How well do you know God? Because every day that you know God will draw you that much closer to him every day. Because let me tell you something. I would love to tell you that each person that's in this room today is sacred and they're holy. But let me tell you something. Sometimes the only holes or the holy we got is in our pants, our T-shirts. Why? Because we're human. We all have faults. We all have problems. 
And we can't look at somebody else and say, y'all need to get it together. Why? Because we got our own problems we need to get together. Amen? And we cannot be looking at somebody else's splinter and not looking at our own two-by-four upside our head. Amen? That's what the Lord said. So many times we're so locked in on telling somebody about their small little things that we forget about the big things. And we got to get rid of this grumbling. We got to get rid of this testifying for Satan thing. So it says that Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and, sent, or, and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke, and he spoke with him. And he took the spirit that was on him and put on the spirit on the or 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. What's interesting, listen to me. Do you see that God took the spirit that was on Moses, lifted it off of him, and put it on the 70 elders? And it says when the 70 elders, when the spirit got put on them, they did not do it again. Let me tell you something. When we find that we're grumbling and complaining, we probably have a lack of the Holy Spirit moving in our life at that point in time. When we find that we're grumbling and complaining and something's not right, maybe we need to stop right then and say, Lord, I better stop and I better ask for a double portion of your blessing right now. I need the Holy Spirit on me because I don't want to do anything else today unless the Holy Spirit directs me and guides me. Guys, let me tell you something. The one thing about church, I wished we had a thousand men in church every day. Why? Because I believe that church needs men today more than we've ever need them in any other point in history. We need men. And we don't need perfect men, but we need willing men. Amen? Because if you take a man that's willing, guys, there's not a point that you can do anything to earn God's grace, you can't do anything to earn God's favor. You can't do anything to earn God's forgiveness. But you can receive by asking. And the great thing that I love about this, this sanctification process is that we don't have to have it perfect all in one day. Amen? So just because you complain today, that don't mean that you're less of a Christian. It doesn't mean that you're less than a person. It just means you're human and you're working some things out. Guys, some of you are going to get some, the wind knocked out of you from time to time. Maybe you're going to make a bad decision. How many of you made a bad decision today? Guys, I'm here to tell you the best decision that you'll ever make in your life is to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He ain't asking you to be perfect. And when people come up to me, and man, I've had so many times as a pastor, you walk up to somebody and they're drunk. How many of you ever talked to a drunk? And the first thing they want to do is they want to tell you, oh, I'm not drunk. Yeah, you are. Don't lie about it. Just go with where you're at. And to be honest with you, being drunk in front of a pastor is no more of a sin than it is to be drunk in front of somebody else. Why? Because the pastor is nobody. Is just a man, it's just a person. But God is with you all the time. And a lot of times when we're trying to numb ourselves, maybe we're trying to find a way to get past this inadequacy. And what happens when we feel inadequate? We start mumbling, grumbling, and complaining. Guys, I'm here to tell you that if you recognize who you are in the Bible, in the Word of God, all of a sudden you will find out that you are special. You were chosen. Remember I was talking about Jesus walking on the storm? And it says that all the disciples were in the boat and the storm is raging. How many of you have been in a storm recently? Anybody? Feel like the enemy is about ready to sink your boat? But you know what's interesting? It says they see this guy walking out amongst the storm, amongst all the waves, the thunder and lightning going on over here, the waves crashing in over here, the rain pelting in. And all of a sudden, they look out there, and they see this man walking across the water. And the first thing they do is they yell out, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. But they keep looking. And then they finally realize who it is. And then they asked him to get in the boat. And the most interesting thing, it says that he was willing. 
Do you understand that even when you're in the midst of the storm, he's not, that, he's not too far away from you? And he's willing to get in your boat with you at any given point in time. He is willing to just say, okay, let me hop up in that boat. Let me come sit down with you. Let me come talk with you. Let me come share this. Let me tell you something. If I see a dude walking across the water during the middle of a storm, I want that cat in my boat. How many of you ever went fishing and the boat started getting a little full of water? Maybe your pump wasn't working. Uh, maybe your Folgers pump wasn't working. How many of you know what a Folgers pump is? Where you've got a Folgers coffee can and you're trying to throw water out? Guys, if Jesus is in that boat, listen to me, you'll never sink. There may be some times where you get a little scared from time to time. But you'll never sink. When the, he told the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side. I want to share this with you and then I'm going to release you tonight. I'm sorry. Media team that I gave you all audibles tonight. When Jesus told them to go to the other side, there was a storm. There was all these things going on. Then they worried. They thought they were going to sink. But how many of you know, because Jesus said go to the other side, it didn't say go out in the, in the, the lake and let the boat sink. Even if the boat would have sunk, it would have been the first known example of a submarine because it would have still got to the other side. Why? Because Jesus said, get in the boat and go to the other side. There was nothing different about what God said. But sometimes we try to add in our fears, don't we? We try to think that maybe the boat's going to sink. Maybe this is going to happen. Maybe that's going to happen. But maybe we need to start listening to what God said. When he said, just get in the boat and go to the other side, keep your eyes on the prize, keep focused on what you're supposed to be doing. When G or what is Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other, Jesse, will be added unto you. Guys, manna, what happened? It got added onto them at nighttime, didn't it? When they woke up, there it was. Guys, God's blessings are going to come to you tomorrow, but you've got to go process them. You've got to pick them up. You've got to process it, and you've got to make it. Quit waiting at a mailbox, waiting for a check to solve all your problems. That is not what the church was called for. The church was called to be blessed, but also to walk with elbow grease. Remember, when the devil shows up at your door, as that song said, somebody's knocking. You need to learn and discern which knock is happening. If you know who's knocking at your door, you know whether to answer or not. Amen? Guys, I want to bless you tonight. I want you to understand something. You are God's people. You are God's chosen. You're special. The Bible says you're unique. You're different. You're called out. You're called to be separate. Don't, don't give the devil any do about what he's doing in the life. Matter of fact, he is a, a defeated person. He is striking out trying to do everything he can to hold on to that one last little chance, choice that he's got. Let me tell you something. God gave us a choice, and his name was Jesus. And then he gave us the power, and his name was the Holy Spirit. See, there's some times you're going to go through life, and it's not going to be easy. But yet, God gave you the Holy Spirit. Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. Quit watching the news. Quit reading the newspaper. Quit getting worried about everything that's going on in the world. Quit worrying about whether Elon Musk is going to buy out Twitter. Who cares? I got a heavenly social media thing going on. You can post to God anytime you want to. Amen. It's not a matter of our president, although I can't wait for a godly president to come into office. I can't wait for America to wake up and realize we need a revival. But yet I'm not going to sit here and complain. Because why? Because God is able. And he is able to take care of all of my needs. Amen. So if I believe that, I don't have to worry about a president. I don't have to worry about a governor. I don't have to worry about a congressman or a senator. Why? Because I got the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I got the Prince of Peace. I got the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
If I've got that, everything else doesn't matter. Amen? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I thank you for the opportunities to be able to have audibles. Lord, I thank you that, Father, that you would come speak to us tonight. Lord, as we get ready to go home, Father, I know that each and every one of us have some problems. Lord, we have issues that we look at in life, and Father, we get a little upset. Maybe we had something that came in the mail. Maybe it was a phone call. Maybe somebody called and and said, did you hear what so-and-so said? But Lord, the only thing that we care about is what you said. And Lord, you said that you would give us this day our daily bread. Lord, your word said that, Father, that you would take care of all of our needs and that, Lord, we do not have to worry about the strongholds and the enemies, that, Lord, that you have given us the gifts, you have given us the weapons, you have given us the armor, you have given us the things that we need to pull down the strongholds of enemy. Lord, I speak blessings upon this congregation today, that, Lord, as they leave here today, that every single plan that the devil has put against them is canceled out by the blood of Christ Jesus. That, Lord, the strength, the might, the power, the majesty, the glory, the power, the honor, Father, be upon your people. Why? Because your countenance is upon them. Lord, as the priestly blessing says, Lord, may you shine your face upon them, and Lord, may you be gracious to them. Lord, that they are the head and not the tail, the top and not the bottom. They're blessed in their comings. They're blessed in their goings. They're blessed in their homes, their businesses, their health, their finances, but most importantly, their families, Lord. Lord, I pray over our children that, Lord, they would grow up to know you and walk within your authority, your power, and your strength. Lord, I pray for their businesses to flourish, but, Lord, let it be done on the principles of righteousness. So, Father, let everything be done for your glory, your power, your honor, and, Lord, most of all, your joy. So, Father, these are your people. So, Lord, I ask that you bless them, protect them, and, Lord, we just cancel out any plans that the enemy has against them. In Jesus' mighty name. All God's people said, guys, I love y'all so much. If y'all need anything, come on up here and see me. If not, get out of here. It's already three after eight. Amen. Love you.